KKK used to cover their faces. Yes, because that's what cowards do. So they're being toothless. And that's that's what's very frustrating. And the worst thing about it is the the current administration thinks that us normal little people are fools. We can't see what's going on. It's quite insulting. Obviously, the Holocaust was worse, but you're still talking about one and a half million people that were massacred and starved. And the same man who's praising Hamas is saying, well, that didn't happen. The Armenian genocide didn't happen and everything Israel is saying is fake. And it's because he wants power. And the thing is, not all Muslim people feel this way. There are a lot of them that are afraid of this kind of ideology because they understand how dangerous it is. Yes. state in our eternal capital, Jerusalem. I say that to all those who proclaim that the Jewish state has no roots in our region and that it will soon disappear. Throughout our history, the Jewish people have overcome all the tyrants who have sought our destruction. It's their ideologies that have been discarded by history. The people of Israel live on. We say in Hebrew, Am Yisrael Chai. And the Jewish state will live forever.
What a joy to come together. What a joy it is to go before God in our worship and know that there's this communication, there's this exchange from God to us and from us to God. The offering is a moment where we cause everything around us to be still because we're focusing on our provider. We're focusing on our Savior. And as we focus on Him in thanksgiving and in praise, and we bring an offering to Him, you know what He said? Don't come before me empty-handed. That's what He told the children of Israel. And you uh, are well-practiced and you understand the revelation of giving. And I want to encourage you. You know, I was reading again this note that Jane put out and she, there's a picture of Jane on here with the children, it's beautiful. And it says, unfortunately, we are now facing a serious financial challenge. And so in order to continue to do what we do, and we do a lot, we need uh, our, our people to hear and to understand. We know that you have needs in your life, we all do. But you know what? Seed will not produce a harvest unless we plant it. So we want to encourage you in famine and in adversity, plant your seed because that's a guarantee that you're going to have a harvest in the kingdom of God. You know, the Bible says, Psalm 119, 140, all your promises glow with fire that's why I'm a lover of your word. And how many of you have uh, confidence in this day that we're living in, regardless of if you've lost your job or your, your 401k shrinking, you have confidence because you know that you sow into the heavenly realm and in that realm, nothing can be corrupted. I want to encourage you. You're going to do more than make it. God is going to prosper his people, but it's going to continue to take our faith and, and the release of our obedience. And you know what? And God's going to do great things. Let's keep Kim's legacy alive. And speaking of Kim, this beautiful book that we're offering for a gift of $25 or more is these are his writings that are being released now. And I want to say this, you, you you won't get this book, even when you give beyond $25, unless you, you click the banner. You need to click the banner, and when you do, then it lets us know that you, that you actually want the book. So thank you so much for your love and your support. And I wanna tell you, the best days of our lives are ahead, and God's gonna prove it. And we, we pray His blessing over you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Current Events. Israel is not going anywhere, no matter what anyone says. In Romans 11, Paul said, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people from whom he foreknew. The Bible makes it very clear that once they return to the land, they will never be removed again. Make no mistake, there are difficult days ahead, and they will go through a period, the period of time called the Great Tribulation, which is referred to in the Bible as the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30 verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is a time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Israel is fighting for its very existence and decided on a limited attack after being threatened by the current administration. So let's watch this clip now. World leaders are awaiting Iran's next move after Israel's early morning response to the launching of 300 Iranian drones and missiles towards Israel this past weekend. Tonight, neither side is confirming Israel was behind today's attack, but Iran says it did not do any damage. Fox's Trey Yinks has the latest from Tel Aviv. Israel taking aim and firing inside Iran. 
hitting it in retaliation after Iran fired 300 missiles and drones at the Jewish state last Saturday. A U.S. official says Israel struck near a major Iranian air base and nuclear site about 200 miles south of Tehran. Iranian state media says there was no damage to their facilities. It's sending a message to Iran. Uh, they, Iran knows full well that Israel can strike any place inside of Iran. Israel's counterattack was a limited missile strike and did not involve manned aircraft. The U.S. was not involved but was notified beforehand. I believe it was a direct hit on the, uh, the air base. And this is what the New York Times reports. The Israeli missile managed to hit Iran's air defense systems without being detected by Iranian radars. According to two Western sources, the attack was intended to convey a message to Iran according to which Iran can bypass its defensive systems without being detected and paralyze them. The newspaper also reports that two Iranian sources confirmed that Israel managed to hit the radar system of S-300 air defense system stationed in Shikari military base in if Isfahan. The attack definitely sent an, a message to the Iranians. And as you can see there from, from the, the little slide, it was a direct hit. And uh, of course, it's all being shut down and not spoken about by the Iranians trying to downplay everything that's happened. So let's go to this next clip now. Isfahan is the site of one of Iran's major nuclear sites, enriching uranium for Iran's nuclear program. According to the Jerusalem Post, the attack on Isfahan was carried out with long-range missiles launched from aircraft, not drones or land-air missiles. An Iranian official told Reuters there is no plan for an immediate response. It is not clear who is behind the attack. An Iranian TV anchor downplayed the attack and quoted a military official in Isfahan. Uh, he did uh, confirm that uh, there were some uh, loud sounds that were heard in the east of the city of Isfahan, and this was related to the air defense system, as uh, we told you and our viewers before, uh, triggered by the presence of uh, three small drones uh, that were present in that area. On local television, other reporters near the area showed how quiet and normal Isfahan looks. Middle East expert Avi Melaman told CBN News Iran seems to be minimizing the story on purpose. Yona Bob, Jerusalem Post military correspondent and author of the book Target Tehran, told CBN News the strike sends a clear message. The message behind the strike from Israel was, Iran, you cannot do what you did last weekend. You attacked Israel directly. You attacked with 350 aerial threats. 170 drones, 120 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles. That cannot happen again. If it does, you will suffer and you will suffer large. You know, when you look at the difference between Israel's response, right, they had to do something. Israel had to respond to the situation, even though the U.S. administration pressured them not to do anything, even though everybody else was freaking out. And this is the part that always gets me. Israel has never one time been the initial aggressor, ever. But then somebody does something to them. It's like the bully at high school that goes and keeps kicking someone. And then when they defend themselves, everybody says, how can you do that? That's literally Israel's entire PR life. And so they had to respond to a degree. And the fact that Iran made such a big thing of it, we're coming for you. You know, we, okay, now we've launched the missiles. Now we know God defended Israel miraculously. We've spoken about that. That was a miracle. But you've got the, you know, you've got the Ayatollah talking about, oh, we're going to do this and the Jews are going to die and all these different things, and it's this big fanfare. Israel says nah, nothing. They don't talk about it. They don't announce it. And just these quick little strikes just remind Iran, we've got more intelligence than you do. We've got more intel than you do. We know what we're doing. And this is the thing I've, I've, quoted, I've quoted Doobie so many times on this. When he and I did this first show after October 7th happened, we did it, you know, the very next day, actually, after, you know, I woke up and realized what was going on and we, we did a show together he said to me from then he said christy if israel was genocidal the war would have ended on october 8th and yeah. israel again this is the thing they're they're masters at playing long it's, it's like a long chess game they can't they're not going to expose their entire hand immediately but it's a good reminder to the world israel knows what they're doing yes there was a failure of intel 
on October 7th. But now you've got a question, who was actually involved in that? It wasn't just Hamas, obviously. Who else was involved? Who else knew? Why were there cameramen ready there to go and film all of this? Why were there, you know, let me not get into all of that, but, you know, there were a lot of people colluding on that because Israel's so hated. But it's a good reminder. Israel didn't have to do much. And I remember driving through Israel with Doobie and he pointed out a particular mountain to me. And he's got this really big laugh when he's very proud of something the military's done. And he said, Christy, let me tell you something. Inside that mountain, no one can burp in Syria without us knowing. I thought I starts laughing. And I thought, you know, this is the kind of confidence that I love to see. So yes, what's happened to Israel is horrific. The fact that there's still hostages in captivity is horrific. The fact that Hamas thanked the US is horrific. But it's just a good little reminder for everybody. You don't want to mess with the IDF, man. And not only that, they're not just your average army. They've got God backing them. Yeah. So that was a fun little reminder, really. Like, look, we can strike. You won't even know. All your systems that are set up to detect us, we can override those. So just, you know, be careful. And I, I enjoyed that. I thought that was a good thing. And, you know, now suddenly it's like, oh, well, if you need to go into Rafa, suddenly, I mean, does Biden even know where Rafa is? Probably no. No, he doesn't. But, you know, suddenly it's just, oh, well, if you need to go in, you know, okay. So, well, it was a miracle, Christy. A definite, it was a miracle that happened um, on April 13th. Yes. And um, that, was a, that was a miracle. Total miracle. Portion. And not only do us Christians acknowledge it, but, but the rabbis in Israel are speaking about it. So let's go to that clip now. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Yitzhak Adlerstein, great to be with you again. Great to be back. Yeah, tell us uh, April 13th or into the 14th, what do you believe happened? I, I believe that we were all witness to nothing short of a miracle of biblical proportions. I think it's going to take a little while for the, the full effect of it, for the facts to set in. But it wasn't, hey, the IDF was really successful with the aid of our allies and Israel survived, even though there was stuff coming in all over the country, literally. 99% of the projectiles coming in, drones and missiles, were, were, were shot down. There was minimal property damage and one, one serious injury in a Bedouin village. Now, how, how do you account for that? You know, um, when, the, when the Jews left uh, Egypt, Passover, which we're on the verge of, um, you had the really great Cecil B. DeMille moments, the 10 plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea. But you know, what happened after that? What happened in the aftermath? There were two countries, both had experienced the same thing. They had witnessed the same thing. But the Israelites went on to Sinai to accept the Torah and make a new covenant with God. The Egyptians went right back to where they were before. This is always what happens with miracles. The believer understands that this is the hand of God. And the non-believer finds some way of accounting for it. And, uh, I don't know, we'll figure it out. We'll kick it down the road a couple of centuries. Somebody will explain it. There's, there's no way to make a believer out of miracles. But for those of us who believe in God's hand in history, how could you not see that this was the hand of God protecting his land? I love what this rabbi said. It's something I've been thinking about. You know, when we look at what happened April 13th, and now we're here recording, we're recording this and the show's going out to you this Saturday. We're in the middle of Passover right now. And I was actually meant to attend a Seder or a Passover meal with a bunch of my Jewish friends out here, but unfortunately I'm ill with a sinus infection, so I wasn't able to attend. But I've been thinking about the Exodus account so much and thinking about how these miracles took place. And I love what this rabbi said. The same miracles were seen by two different groups of people. And look what the one did and look what the other did. And that is what we've witnessed. We saw now, you know, Israel's had renewed strength. Dubi showed us clips of people in Tel Aviv dancing and laughing and carrying on with their lives in the face of this kind of pressure in the face of these kinds of the threats but it's because the god of exodus is still at work and we've watched him work now in our lifetime just a couple of weeks ago and while jews around the world are celebrating passover which is the remembrance of the miraculous deliverance 
of the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, taken into the promised land by the deliverer Moses. And this is a time of remembrance for everybody. We've seen a miracle of Exodus proportion just take place. And I know so many things get played down, especially in the media. Oh, well, the Iron Dome did its job. Yes, it did. But there's no way statistically it could have done what it did. This was the hand of the living God that we saw at work. And so I love what that rabbi said. The same group of people, and we're seeing that today. The whole world saw what happened. And some groups of people are, 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 well, you know, still going on and just raging at Israel. But there's a select few like us who are able to recognize the hand of God in modern times and really be amazed that is that we saw what we saw. And that's something for us to take note, for, note of and to take encouragement from. God is still working. We're seeing his hand at work right now. That's so true, Christy. I mean, you know me, I always look at Bible prophecy and, I, and I'm always talking about Ezekiel chapter 38 and watch Russia, Iran, Turkey. These are the, the, uh, the countries that you need to be watching. And of course, uh, the news this week was, of course, um, Erdogan making sure that the Hamas leaders that are trying to leave Qatar because the Qataris, they're getting upset with all the demands put on them by the, the uh, Biden ad administration with this hostage deal situation. So they are getting really upset about the fact that um, we, we, the, the rest of the world are focusing on them, that they're, they're telling the Hamas uh, leaders that they need to find other countries to go to. And of course, Erdogan is opening up his arms and letting them all in to, uh, to Turkey. So watch this clip. Hamas is not a terrorist organization, but a liberation and Islamic fighters group that leads a struggle to protect its lands and citizens. Massive pro-Palestinian protests break out in Istanbul this week as Turkey's President Erdogan accuses the nation of war crimes. They hit a react, Ines Cantor Freedom, who still has family living in Turkey. Great to see you this morning, Ines. Um, what do you see, you know, what you see in Turkey probably is something you're seeing across most of the Muslim world, but across much of the world. What, what do you see, though, uniquely about what's happening in Turkey? You know, thank, thank you for having me. So Erdogan wants to be the savior of the Muslim world. He keeps talking about Palestinian lives and about all the human rights violations. But you know what's so ironic? He never said a word about the Uyghurs, Uy Uyghur Muslims in China. Um, they're Muslim too. He literally commits ethnic cleansing against my Kurdish brothers and sisters and kill him daily. Erdogan is the biggest problem in the region. Ask Armenians, ask Kurdish people, ask Assyrians, ask Cyprus, you know? And Erdogan literally is the first leader in the world that came out and said Hamas is not a terrorist organization. Hmm. And we are talking about a NATO ally. Think about it, think about how crazy that is, you know? So Turkey and Iran is a safe haven for these groups, Hamas, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, they raise huge amount of money for these groups. And actually Erdogan, dictator Erdogan, gives them Turkish passport so they can go in and out of some of these countries out there. So there you can see what's going on um, in the Middle East, especially with Erdogan. And also the, the fact that uh, these Muslim people are, are so under the sway of Erdogan, and he definitely is trying to sway um, the, the Muslim world and, and take control of what's happening in, in the Middle East somehow, Christy. You know, this is the thing is, you know, I saw another thing that Erdogan said just to add to his fun list of things is he's trying to call the, the Armenian genocide that occurred in 1915, which really came about because of the Ottoman Empire, which is the Turkish, you know, it's, it's Turkey. And he's trying to say, well, that was fake. And a million and a half Armenians were still loved and massacred by the Ottoman Empire. And he's trying to say that's fake. And so we've got to remember, there's this entire set of political power plays going on where different nations, we see them jostling for top dog position again. And they hate that the USA is in the top dog position. So we see Putin fighting because he wants the rise of the Soviet empire again. 
And we see Erdogan fighting and he thinks, this is at least my opinion of everything that I've watched, the 70-year-old man, you know, watching him, he wants to take control and be a leader of the Muslim world to bring about a unity of Muslims because he wants to lead that, because leading it needs power. And the fact that he's standing around doing what he's doing, offering passports to Hamas, you know, advocating for them, saying things like they're not a terrorist organization. This man has been a pain. He has been a thorn in the side of Israel for a very long time. Yes. Fact that now he's also coming out and saying, you know, well, the Armenian genocide is fake. It's the same thing as people saying that the Holocaust yes. is fake. Obviously, the Holocaust was worse, but you're still talking about one and a half million people that were massacred and starved. And the same man who's praising Hamas is saying, well, that didn't happen. The Armenian genocide didn't happen and everything Israel's saying is fake. And it's because he wants power. And the thing is, not all Muslim people feel this way. There are a lot of them that are afraid of this kind of ideology because they understand how dangerous it is. Yes, definitely. Well, um, I was very interested by this clip that I'm going to play you now because it's from the perspective of an, uh, a Muslim man from United Arab Emirates. And he is actually speaking the truth. So let's watch this clip now. What happened on the 7th of October, let's start with that. It was a genocide. It was against humanity. It was against the Jews, against the Muslims, against the Arabs. Support the people of Gaza who free them from Hamas and any terrorist that takes them to darkness. Because now we are in the age of access to info. You can no longer lie to me. You can't tell me that you didn't rape because I saw the footage online, HD quality, you recorded it. You posted it, you start removing it. You can't tell me you didn't burn people's houses because I went on TikTok, I can see it. You can't tell me that you, you didn't have those hostages. I go on the live Snapchat area, map, close, get close, I can see it. In 2003, you had the TV, that's it. One cameraman that decides exactly what you're going to see, which I believe was the age of deception when it comes to pictures and images. But now because we have the access, humanity understands more and one thing I can tell you please do not judge the people of the Middle East through Al Jazeera TV mm -hmm. and don't judge us by a couple of people who are sitting on the couch <laughs> they're way from the Middle East hours away from the Middle East miles away from the Middle East and they themselves escaped from dictators in Gaza Dictators in Syria, dictators in Afghanistan, dictators in Iran. They live in the West, using the freedom of the West to abuse others, to not see facts of the Middle East from the angle and the view of that person and that individual. You know, it's interesting hearing um, an, a, a Muslim person saying these things. And what's so interesting is he's right. Before we had one camera, one television, and whatever information we were able to gather, that's all we would have to base our decisions on. But now everybody's got a phone in their hand with a camera, and we can see what's going on. And we, more and more people the world over, are realizing how much we are being lied to and manipulated. Um, and because it's so undeniable at this stage, because like you said, Hamas, People can say whatever they want to. We remember October 7th was just a few months ago. We remember them doing these things, releasing these insane videos, the complete disregard for human life, the complete madness that occurred on that day um, cannot be uh, twisted. Like Chrissy was just saying, oh, well, now Erdogan's saying, well, the Armenian genocide never happened. Nobody can ever say Hamas didn't do this. Because every single one of us saw it. They were releasing the videos. They celebrate. Everybody's so happy about killing Jews. And it's so insane to me that, yes, you, you're going to have uh, um, um, Muslim people who are not in that extreme are also realizing this is insane. Yes. Um, and it, it's dangerous to everybody because 
there's always a way to divide people. And so people need to understand that it's, this situation that we're in where we're just binding ourselves up in law because of fear and trying to control things. And it, it really is so frustrating. And then, you know, another thing that's been going on is these protests at the universities. Yes. And um, I think we actually have a clip on that. So how about we have a look at that clip and then we can come back and talk about this because this is all tied in with the protests and these, and these students. Here to discuss it are Columbia University students, Alicia Baker and Andrew Parker Stein. Uh, Andrew, it was you Saturday night, right? What happened? So basically, um, a bunch of Jewish students came to campus to respond to the encampment. We just sang songs of peace. Um, on the way out, a pro-Hamas mob started chasing us, calling us in the middle of campus, calling us inbred, that we have no culture. Um, one of them grabbed my friend's Israeli flag in the middle of campus, carried it to a mob by the gate that were communicating with the angry mobs outside of campus. They threw hard objects at him. They started harassing him. They tried to light his flag on fire, and there, nothing is done with this. And after that, on the way out, we were talking to public safety. They started following us on the way out, and public safety just shrugged their shoulder. They're, supposed to, they're the ones who are responsible in protecting us. And the only protection that we had was we have one student who's a 6'5 student and everyone hid behind him as we were leaving campus. And an angry mob of pro-Hamas students chased us off of campus, screaming, we don't want no Zionists here, get out of here, F Israel, and a bunch of other- And these are students. Writers. So that's a great question. Uh, this is the most shocking thing on campus right now. We have video proof of people sneaking into campus. They're, the encampment themselves are bragging about the fact that many aren't students. Right. And so we don't know if they're students. Likely they're students. They might not be students. And Columbia is doing nothing about the fact. Unbelievable. They just shut down school. Alicia, what's your experience? I mean, look, we've been calling this out for six months now. We know that these are anti-Semites using anti-Semitic Since the October 7th attack. Since the October 7th attack since the first set of protests on October 12th. And now we see what happens when you don't shut down anti-Semitic rhetoric and you allow these people to feel entitled. You know, there were some arrests on Thursday. That was great. I, can, I commend the university for doing that. Guess what? They walk 20 yards to their left. They do the exact same thing on the other lawn and they've been there since Thursday. And now they're harassing us. They're yelling, go back to Poland. You know, when they say we don't want no Zionists here and death to the Zionist state, you know, what's the game plan? Where should we go? Right. Now they're saying go back to Poland. We all know what happened last time the Jews were in Poland. Okay, so in, in 2012, my dad uh, had been prophesying about the Fourth Reich and a rise of a Fourth Reich. And he sent me to Poland, to Auschwitz, to uh, all through Europe. He sent me to very key places. Um, and at the time, you know, I ended up at Auschwitz and at the time, there were people there um, that I met, and I met a survivor even, and they were warning the survivor, the lady who had survived Birkenau 2, Birkenau 1. Um, she was a little old lady by the time I met her. And she said to me, this is going to happen again. And I was there with her, some other people, and we were all saying, that's impossible. Couldn't it? Well, here we stand in the Holocaust Museum. How could anybody... You know, how could this ever happen again? We, you know, it seemed, seemed like such an extreme statement. And then I'm looking at this footage of these students and the way they are treating Jewish people. I mean, if you go back two years ago, you couldn't say a word about George Soros without being called an anti-Semite. But you can stand outside of the universities across this country shouting death to America and death to Israel and, and calling for the destruction of the Jews. It, the hypocrisy is outrageous. <laughs> and, and how important this is, 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 is uh, revealed to me in this moment because my dad, who was a prophet, sent me, after prophesying about Fourth Reich and the rise of this Fourth Reich, sent me to Europe and, so, and, and to these places, to, to Poland, to see this, as they're saying this, send them back to Poland. I was in Poland. My father sent me there. And so... We have to understand the gravity of this because not only are we witnessing all this crazy stuff, but my dad, God showed my dad this was coming as well. And that's very important uh, to me in looking at this because my experience of this is not that long ago in 2012, there I stood in Auschwitz thinking that would never happen. It's impossible. Now I'm sitting here thinking, oh my goodness gracious, yes. this is happening again. Well, these universities and um are funded by 
uh, show up that uh, uh, a little clip that I have up there. Uh, you can see the amount of money coming from these uh, Middle Eastern countries. Not only that, but from Russia as well. And you can see the amount of money uh, these countries are sending to these universities. Yes. And it's because the, the students going to these universities are actually students. They're not United States citizens. And I think that a lot of what's happening are these students who are not United States citizens. They're the ones that are causing all the reactions and all these, this that's going on. It's these, the, the, they should be deported. That's what I feel is they should be deported. They cannot stand in the streets of the United States. I mean, we have freedom of speech, but at the same time, why would people stand in the streets of their own country and call for the death of their own nation, the death of their own selves? It's crazy. But you see, these 20 year olds are being manipulated yes. and, and, and they, they don't understand what's happened in, in the world. And they, they've got, Friends that are, are that come over from these countries and that are are, are influencing them. Yes, and they're lied to. Yes, because they're young, they have no experience, they don't understand history, and they selectively taught history now in these universities that you're probably paying tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars to send your children to be educated in these places that are not properly educating your children, and that is a serious problem no. in these countries and across the West. And also, you showed me a a. a the tents, yeah. and all these tents are, they're all the same. So how can, t tell them about that. The other thing is that now the protesters are, are all going to stay outside and they're going to sleep outside. And if you look at, I, I don't have the image with me, but there's an image that was on social media and you can see all of their tents are put up and it was just like the summer of love. Everybody had the same exact tent. Every time you see this, these staged protests that happened and everybody's given the supplies and so the thing all oh, looked the same. Second, they didn't just look the same; they were the identical tents. So it just came like it came out of a crate from such and such. Here's your tents, everybody. And now everybody put on your masks, and everybody is covered. Their faces are covered in masks. COVID is not that big of a problem right now. The people need to be wearing masks. That's not going on. Why would they be telling these people to the, these kids to cover their faces? You know who used to cover their faces? The KKK used to cover their faces. Yes, because that's what cowards do. So they're right. being toothless. And that's, that's what's very frustrating. And the worst thing about it is the, the current administration thinks that us normal little people are fools. We can't see what's going on. It's quite insulting. Well, Christy? You know, the, the end of that other clip that we just watched where it said, you know, the Jews are being told, go back to Poland. And he says, we know what happened the last time the Jews were told to leave Poland. This is not a new problem. Yeah. This is a problem that has been around for the longest time. Everybody starts getting incredibly anti-Semitic because this is a demonic spirit. We yes. need to remember, this is not just your average human that suddenly decides, oh, we're going to blame the Jews for everything. Even. This is demonic. And I'm saying that with complete confidence. This is a war that is being waged, not just in the natural. This is a supernatural war that has been going on for thousands of years. And it's the same problem as, as, as the Jews have faced for the longest time. You know, whether you look at the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, when the Jews went back to go rebuild the land, oh, well, we don't want them here because look at them. They're a riotous uh, and uprising sort of people. But then we also don't want them in this area of the land. We don't want them in our land. And that's what everybody keeps asking. Where the heck do you want them to go? Where do you want the Jews to go? They have such a tiny portion of the earth. They have got such a tiny little nation. They make up less than half of 1% of the global population, but everybody blames them for everything. We have to have open eyes and see clearly here that there is something genuinely supernatural and demonic going on. Yes. And even what we're seeing on these campuses, it's like importing mini terrorists. And I'll say that because I don't care. It's like they're importing mini terrorists. And there's a man, I was trying to actually look on my bookshelf to see if I still have this book out here or not. Yes, I do. Behold, behind my Israeli flag. This is a book written in 2006 by a man named Bruce Bauer. Now, I, this man is not a Christian. This man is a sociologist. And he wrote this in 2006. I read it. Look, it's right there behind my little Israel flag. I'm going to sell five. 
And he wrote about how there was a systemic plan to implant Muslims into universities across America and the West to send them in to be able to take on positions of government, to be able to take on positions of tenureship as professors. And he said, you're going to see the tide change and the rhetoric change to become more and more anti-Jew and more and more pro-Islamic. And he said, this is a plan that they've been working on for decades. And he predicted that the mayor of London one day would be a Muslim. And he predicted that one day the most popular boy's name in England would be Muhammad. And he's correct. Yes. Think about that. 2006, he wrote that. He wasn't writing with the eye of prophecy. He wasn't writing from the viewpoint of the scriptures. He was looking at it anthropologically, sociologically, and geopolitically. And he said, this is what I predict is going to happen because this is what I can see them doing. And this is what they've done. They've imported ideology, mashed it up into something that looks like, oh, look, it's the poor little students that are coming from these third world countries and from other countries. And all they're trying to do is take on the plight of the victim. Because the second you stamp victim onto something nowadays, suddenly you can do no wrong. And so it infuriates me. But it's also something I have been talking about this literally from when I read this book and everybody was like, oh, you're, you know, you're crazy. That's never going to happen. And he predicted that there would be times when there would be entire neighborhoods. He was specifically talking about the UK and Europe. And he said, you're going to see entire neighborhoods where all the signs are in Arabic and there's not even English anymore. And we're seeing it now. Think about the pro-Palestinian protests. Yes, we're seeing these on university campuses, which is horrifying. But it, it is also the fact that they're not American and they're sitting here chanting death to America. And what do the Americans do? Go and buy their little matching tents. God help us. Oh, my goodness. Ha, ha, it really? God. Oh, heavens. It is it, the truth. It's shocking. It's really shocking to see where we've come, how far we have fallen, how far we have fallen. And... Um, I just don't even know what else to say about my leaks. Just, but you know what? I do actually have a prophecy of dads to play. Yeah. I pulled. I think we have one of the fourth five prophecies. One of them. Okay. So um, before we leave today, I did want you just to, to see at least one of the prophecies my dad uh, uh, gave about the rise of the fourth Reich. It's very interesting, and he he had gone through Europe and began to to pick up on it prophetically and prophesy uh, the very thing that we are seeing occur. So let's watch, uh, let's watch Dad, let's see what Dad, Dad had to say. It was 2010. You made an alliance. You were an ally to the Third Reich. There is a false one arising from the East to take over your street. Take over your children and remove Jesus. But the Spirit of God said, truth will prevail. A cause will not prevail. And the people will begin to arise from the streets. And I will manifest myself in whorehouses. I'll go to red light districts. I'll begin to take them from their place of pain and turn it into a place of rain, says the Lord. Come on. Come on. God said there's going to be a reformation. But this time, God said, I'll use Germany. I'll use Italy. I'll use Holland, the Netherlands. I'll use France. They will stand and they will stand against the spirit. And that will be that will be the countries that I'll begin a great reformation, and there will be an abolishment of the laws of men. And your young men and young women shall rise, 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 and shout, shout, shout. Now, what you'll notice about that prophecy is that he's very focused on the children and what they would be doing to the children. And uh, I think the most beautiful part about that is that it reminds us that God knows what's going on. And he's not just sitting around watching that God is moving in ways that we cannot see. Yes. 
uh, in front of us or maybe even on our phones. There's things going on. My dad saw and prophesied on other occasions that Damascus Road conversions, we've seen a lot of that with Muslim people who are, who are having visions of Christ, of Jesus, dreams, and they don't know what to do with it. And they're going secretly, having to go secretly to the Christians and ask them because they'll get killed if they leave Islam. So, I mean, that alone should say everything uh, there. But also, I, 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 I'm, I was comforted to hear my dad when he prophesied, speaking of the young children. Um, and, and on many occasions, uh, in other prophecies, he spoke about the universities and the colleges and what would be exposed and what they were doing to the young minds. And so that is encouraging to me because now from every angle we're seeing that, yes, these terrible things are happening. Yes, we understand the time that we're in and what that means, but we also know we haven't been abandoned, that God is moving. And so that's, I know, that's very encouraging to me. Yes. And then um, I think we are done for the we day. Did. And on but, that encouraging note, yeah, and, that, and Dad did it very well. Shame he did, didn't he? <laughs> we miss him. Actually, speaking of him, I have some of his books here, you guys. Um, so um, if you are giving an offering today, and we do need uh, we do need continued support to be able to keep bringing you these prophecies and keeping you informed and continuing the legacy of, of my father, Kim Clement, and those of you who are a part of that have really been so amazing in continuing to support us through a very difficult time for our family in this ministry. We've continued on because we understand how important this is, and we could not take all of those prophecies and all of this and bury it away. Um, we knew that we had a responsibility to keep bringing these broadcasts to you, bringing the prophecies to you, and bringing this information to you um, in a time where it's, it's so easy to be deceived. That uh, for many years, many of you have been with us all the way back to when mom and dad started in the mid-2000s, mid and they, uh, dad got there on camera and started prophesying and, and speaking to all of you. Um, many of you still watch us and support us, and we thank you so much for that. And we do need to... Uh, continue that support and many others who are telling the truth in this time and, and they are censored and they have to be brave. There's so many of us that God is using and there is a parallel economy that has been created. And let me tell you, the liberals and their left, they absolutely hate it because they can't control it. And so when you are contributing and giving an offering to us at the House of Destiny and this ministry, other ministries, other voices that are, are speaking truth to you, you are sowing a very crucial scene, uh, seed in the season. Um, it's not just about, uh, it, there's so much more to it because now you may be feeling helpless at home and you see the stuff on the news. What can I do? What can I do? You can, uh, you can support the people and the ministries that God has chosen to be a voice in the season. And so there's many ways that you can give. Um, there's a, a, it'll be scrolling below the screen there. And the text to give is my favorite. I just did it the other day. I gave an offering and used the text to give for someone else. And it was, uh, it was so easy. And so I like that to that. But you can mail an offering. You can uh, go on the website. You can click the red link there. Uh, but when you do that, we have some stuff to give back to you. So the first thing is for an offering of any amount, you can get this. And this is the Daily Light. I love this. It's a 31-day devotional we put together. Um, all written by my dad. It was emails he used to send to everybody in the family and staff. Every morning we'd get the daily light. And it was so exciting. And so we've put it into a, a devotional for you. And so for an offering of any amount, uh, we'll send you this. But you do need to do that on the website and you need to click the banner because there'll be banners on there. Um, and then, of course, we have the new release, which has uh, Prophetic Revelations, a collection of letters from the pen of Kim Clement. This is more of incredible things he's written. And let me tell you something, it is so poetic and beautiful as my dad was so good at those things, but there's so much wisdom and insight into the prophetic and understanding discernment and understanding so many things. And so for a donation of $25 or more, this is our new release, um, we'll send you this book. But you do need to remember, if you want the books, if you want these, uh, when you give your offering, make sure you go on the website and do it uh, through the website and click the banner and you can get these. Isn't that exciting? I'm yeah. so excited about it. So anyway, that's, uh, that's all I have today, Mom. Yes. Well, there's so much going on in the world, and we're keeping you informed. We're watching, and we expect that, and God expects for you to watch as well, because we're, we're, we're told to watch what's happening in the news so we can know what God is going to be doing next. So with that, I would love to 
encourage you to watch the next current events and we'll see you then. Hello, House of Destiny. Today we have a missions update that is actually really wonderful, starting with Cambodia. 15 children without homes, without parents, without anyone to love them, were accepted into the foster care program, not over a course of six months or 12 months, but in just one month, 15 children were placed out of incredible situations and circumstances, they were placed into the foster care program. And the main shelter along the Thai border is shutting down. And that's where majority of these children came from and they all needed placement. So we were able to go in to place these children in all of these caring, loving homes with families, with people who will love them and care for them, supply shelter and food and make sure that they are taken care of. Along with that, in Palin, Lisbeth is her name and her two siblings. Now, Lisbeth is not 18. She's not 21. She's a little girl, and she was caring for both siblings that were younger than her, and she did that for a while in extreme circumstances. She was doing the absolute best that she could, but all three of them were accepted into the same foster care program, so they were able to stay together, and she was able to regain a very lost childhood. I couldn't even imagine being 10, 11, and having to take care of two younger siblings because of the circumstances or choices of my parents. And she did that with incredible bravery and strength, but now she can have a normal childhood as well as her siblings, all because of your giving. Your seeds of love have gone far beyond what you can even begin to think or imagine. All of these children were without hope, without love, and without the possibility of having a childhood. They would have been abandoned and left to raise themselves. But because of your seeds of love, we have been able to go in, rescue these children, place them in great loving homes, and that is all because of you. If you're watching this and you're not a partner, man, I would encourage you to become a partner today. Be a part of rescuing these children and being the true hands and feet of Jesus. If you're wondering how to do that, make sure that you click the link right there on your screen and let's become partners and continue to impact the world. Welcome to Real Life, Real Faith. Um, do you need some encouragement right now in your life? You had such an amazing experience with God, you know, but sometimes feelings come and feelings go. The experiences we have with God are, are not just about feeling, they're spiritual truths, His revelation to us, who He is coming into our lives. We're gonna be talking about Alpha and Omega and what we do in the middle, that time where I guess you can say we're waiting on God. Join us and let's grow stronger together. Today's climate truly dictates that we need to learn to not only hear His voice, but to know His voice. And very important, hearing and knowing His voice, but also understanding what his word is saying. You know, the writer of Proverbs speaks about wisdom and understanding. He speaks about wisdom as being feminine. Let her have her way inside of us, wisdom. And then he, I love the way he said, and apply understanding to both the wisdom and the knowledge of God. We need to have understanding in these last days because see, God wants you and I who know him, who have sought him, who have spent time with him, he really wants us to sharpen our hearing, our knowing, because these are truly the last few moments upon this earth. We here at the House of Destiny are partnering with you to let our, our viewers, of course, know about your company. It's Beverly Hills Precious Metal. Andrew, explain how that works. So I'll walk you through it right now. So. If you go to bh-pm.com, 
right there on the homepage, you'll see a form that you could fill out. And that form is very important in letting us know how we can help you. So you just put in your first name, last name, email address, phone number. There's a section that says, how did you hear about us? And in there, put Kim Clement. And then there's a portion where you could write a couple of notes down on the bottom. Usually within about 24 to 48, 48 hours, we'll contact you by phone call. And then we'll go over everything with you. This isn't a high pressure deal. We always recommend that uh, if you feel uncomfortable, take a step back, pray about it. You will gain the answers that you need by doing that and come back to us when you're comfortable. I'm excited to announce we're having a huge MyPillow spring sale. And here's a few examples. Buy one of our MyPillow 2.0s, you get another MyPillow 2.0 absolutely free. Made with cooling technology, the best pillow ever just got even better. And this just in, nine brand new colors and styles of our Percale bed sheets. They're made with the finest long staple cotton, and now you can save 50% or more. That's as low as $24.98. And for the first time this year, I'm bringing you our My Slippers and Sandals for as low as $25 a pair. So go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use your promo code to get your MyPillow 2.0s. Buy one, get one free. Percale sheets as low as $24.98. My Slippers and Sandals as low as $25 a pair. And for a limited time, when you order $75 or more, your entire order ships absolutely free.